Now for a preview of a topic that you'll treat in great detail in future CS classes. There's a very important question that we need to ask every time we write a method, and that is, what happens when I increase the quantity of data that this method is going to process? If I double the amount of data, does that double the method's runtime, or does it triple it, or quadruple it, or does it have no effect? We call this kind of examination complexity analysis. So let's look at a couple of examples. Why don't we first look at the sum method that we looked at a couple of units ago. This method takes an array whose size can be anything, and it just returns the sum of the array. If we want to think about this method's runtime, its execution time, then beside each statement, we can just write a little symbol or a variable that sort of indicates the amount of time that that statement would take to run. Now, we don't really have a way of knowing what those exact times actually are, so we'll just stick with the symbols for now. That's the best we can do. So we'll assume that this assignment statement, int result equals zero, will say that it takes t1 units of time. Okay, and the overhead for a for loop going around the loop, uh, going a single time, we'll say that takes t2 units of time. And the assignment inside the loop, that takes a t3 units of time every time it runs. And the return statement, just a single time, it runs in t4 units of time. If we add these times together, and we sort of remember that the method is going to go around the loop n times, where n means the, the array's size, that's going to give us a runtime that looks like this. The assignment plus the expenditures for each run of the loop times the number of elements, that means how many times we're going to run that loop, plus the time that it takes to do the return statement. We could combine t1 and t4 into some constant k1, and likewise, we could combine t2 and t3 into a constant k2. And as our n, as the size of our array, as the number of elements we're processing, as that gets really big, that constant term k1, its contribution becomes pretty negligible. It becomes really small. So all we're left with is n times k2 as our expression of the runtime of this method. What this is telling us is that the runtime is linearly dependent on the length of the array. The linear equation. So we'd say here that doubling the length of the array doubles the runtime of the method, or tripling it triples the runtime of the method. Computer scientists will typically express this kind of linear relationship between the array's length and the runtime of the array using what we call big O notation. So we'll say, if we're trying to describe the complexity of this method, we'll say that it's big O of n. It's a linear growth relationship. Or if we wanted to phrase it a little bit differently, we could say that the runtime is on the order of n, or is order n. One quirk of doing this kind of back of the envelope calculation of runtime is that you get a situation in big O notation like this, where we don't really draw a distinction between a method whose runtime is a million plus a million times n, and n over a million. They're both considered to be uh, linear time methods. They're both considered to be of the same order, even though in practice, uh, the, the difference is quite large. We can do this kind of complexity analysis for recursive methods too. So here's a recursive version of the sum method, and it is also O of n. You can see we're assigning units of time to these operations as well. So this comparison, this if statement, uh, the comparison takes t1 units of time, and uh, if i is greater than or equal to the length, well, the return statement will take t2 units of time, and uh, otherwise we look at the other return statement, that's going to be uh, a t3 units of time for the call and the return. If we call this method initially with i equals 0, a single call of the method is going to take t1 plus t2, in other words, the comparison plus the return, if i is greater than or equal to the length, and it's going to take t1 plus t3, in other words, the comparison plus the call and return statement, if i is less than the length. This first case happens just a single time. And the second case happens a dot length times whenever the method is called recursively. In other words, this captures the time for our base case, and this captures the time for our recursive case. So if we set n to be the length of the array, we end up with a, a runtime analysis that looks something like this. There's the time it takes for our final comparison and our final return. That expresses the base case time, plus the time for the recursive case times however many elements there are in the array. Well, t1 and t2, they'll combine to be some constant, which we'll end up ignoring, and we end up with this linear expression, n times k2. That tells us this is a, a linear order algorithm. A couple of the other array processing methods that we've looked at so far are also O of n. You can see here the linear search method that we've seen before. 
We're assigning times for the overhead of this loop, for uh, the comparison inside the loop, for a potential return statement at, at point one, and also for a return statement at point two as well, uh, T1, T2, T3, and T4. Now, analyzing this runtime is a little bit more complex than uh, what we saw with the sum method. Each time we run through the loop, we make a comparison, and whenever we find a match, the method is going to return out of that loop with the index uh, of the search value. If we assume that the search is usually made for values that actually are present in the array, then on average, we can expect that about half of the elements in the array are going to get looked at before we find a match. So putting it all together, it looks something like this. You know, on average, we're going to look at half the elements, so our factor here is n divided by 2, times all the stuff that happens every time the loop runs, plus the time it takes to do our final return here at the end. So that turns into a constant, k2. Uh, the elements inside the, these parentheses are also a constant, k1. We see we have a linear expression here, so we can tell this algorithm is also O of n. In other words, doubling the size of our input array would about double the amount of time it would take to run the method. Let's also take a look at a method that processes 2D arrays. Okay, we're assigning times here, T1 for this instantiation, T2 for the loop overhead, the outer loop overhead, uh, T3 for the inner loop overhead, T4 for this assignment that happens on the inside, and T5 for the final return statement, which happens outside those loops. So let's assume that there are n elements in the array, which are broken up into r rows and c columns. Well, we can see the three sort of big buckets of time that are being spent in, in this method. Uh, there's the initial time that it takes to, uh, to instantiate the array row sum. Uh, there's also, the, at the end, there's the time that it takes to return row sum, which is uh, the t5. And then in the middle, there's all the stuff that happens in the loop. For each row, we have our loop overhead, Plus, for each column, uh, we have the overhead for that column's run of the inner loop and the assignment. Uh, if we then go ahead and do some simplification, well, we understand that if there are n elements in the array and there are r rows and c columns, then that just means that r equals n over c. So we can plug that in and do some distribution. And uh, we can also here simplify t1 as well. If we want to ballpark how much time it will take to instantiate the array row sum, well, let's assume that the computer can, can allocate the memory for, for the array row sum in constant time. That's this k1. And then it also has to go through and initialize every element in row sum to zero. So that's going to depend on the number of elements in row sum. So t1 ends up looking like this if we're trying to estimate what it, its actual value would be. t5 then stays the same. Continue with the algebra. Uh, you can pause the video and, and pick through it if you'd like. You end up with this expression where k1, k2, k3, and k4 are all constants. We see we end up with a linear relationship. So the big O here ends up being big O of n. We have a linearly growing method, an algorithm that runs in linear time. But not all array processing methods run in linear time. They're not all big O of n. And we see this if we take a look at bubble sort, and we try to do the same sort of analysis. We'll first take a look at a dumber version of the method than the one that we looked at before. So this one doesn't track whether or not we made a swap. So there's no early exit, even if the list is totally sorted. The outer loop of this sort method is going to run n minus 1 times, where n is the length of the array. And each time the inner loop is activated, it's going to iterate a different number of times. So on the first run, it's going to run n minus 1 times. And on the second run, it'll run n minus 2 times, and so on, until the last run, it iterates a single time. So that means that on average, the number of iterations we're going to have is n over 2, n divided by 2. Now on some iterations, elements a sub i and a sub j, they'll get swapped, and that'll take time t4. And on other iterations, they won't get swapped. So on the average iteration, we'll sort of wave our hands and we'll say that we spend time t6 doing an interchange, doing a swap. And that, that's our, our way of baking into our back of the envelope calculations, the fact that sometimes there's a swap, sometimes there's not. So we can express the runtime then as this expression, t1 plus all of this, and this accounts for both of the outer loop and the inner loop, and the time that on average we spend doing a swap. Now hopefully what you can see here, and pause the video and pick through it if you'd like, when we have this term n minus 1, 
and we're multiplying it by all of this. Inside here, we have another n term. So we're going to end up doing n times n. We're going to get an n squared term. So that means that this algorithm actually takes O of n squared time, which means that if I double the size of the array that it's working on, on average, it's going to take four times as long. Or if I triple the size of the array that we're working on, it's going to take about nine times longer. As we've talked about before, we can change this method to track whether or not we've made a swap inside the nested loop. And then if no swap gets made, then the array, we know it's sorted, and so we can just exit the method early. Usually, we do make a swap on each pass, so on average, this trick doesn't really improve bubble sort's complexity that much. Um, but in the best case possible, in, in which case, you know, the, the array is already sorted, in the best case, it can improve the method's runtime to linear time rather than this quadratic time. So now we've seen a bunch of linear methods, and we've also seen one quadratic method, O of n squared. So those are just two of the most frequently encountered big O values, the most common ones that you'll see. And here we can see a bunch of the other common ones, along with their actual names. If you're wondering what an O of 1 or a constant time algorithm looks like, you know, think of a method that just returns the sum of the first and last numbers of an array. You know, this method's runtime doesn't really depend at all on how long the array is. In other words, it takes constant time. Just however long it takes to access the first one, plus however long it takes to access the second one. A little bit later, we're going to see some examples of methods that are logarithmic and, uh, and n log n as well. You might think of these values as being ordered from best to worst, which is, you know, fastest to slowest. So, for example, if you have two methods that do the same thing but in different ways, we tend to prefer the one that's O of n, say, over one that's O of n squared. Now, maybe it's worthwhile talking about that statement a little bit more. So you think about two methods. And we have exact run times for them. The first method uh, takes 10,000 plus 400n. The second method takes 10,000 plus n squared. And the question is, which method do we prefer in which case? Hopefully, the thing that's jumping out to you is that for very small values of n, method 2 is actually faster than method 1, even though it's quadratic, even though it's O of n squared. But, and this is the important thing, for all values of n that are larger than some threshold, method 1 is faster. That linear time algorithm is faster. In this case, the threshold is 400. So if you know ahead of time that your n, the size of the data set that you're going to be working with, is always less than 400, then it would be a smart move to use method 2, this O of n squared method, even though it's O of n squared. But if n is going to have a large range of possible values, if, you know, it might exceed 400, then you probably want to go with method one. A little side note real quick before we go on. If we're doing complexity analysis now, and again, with complexity analysis, we do sort of play things fast and loose. We don't need to distinguish between uh, base two and base 10 logs because they really only differ by a constant factor. You can see here the, the change of base formula. If you want to get a sense of how the common big O values vary with n, take a look at this table. So here we use base 10 logarithms, just for reference. This really shows that a method might be useful for small n, small values of n, but totally useless for really big values. And you can see here, if I have a problem that can only be solved using an exponential runtime algorithm, you know, that gets really big really fast. That's 1.1 to the times 10 to the 301st power. Even if I were to run them on the world's most powerful computer for billions of years, right, it's still going to take forever. The problem is there are actually a lot of important problems that even the best algorithms that we have to solve them take exponential time. Um, if you want to get famous, that's, that's one thing you can do, is you can replace one of those exponential time algorithms with one that takes something less, you know, some polynomial or quadratic time. We've seen two algorithms for computing Fibonacci numbers, one of which was iterative and the other of which was recursive. The iterative version that we saw before is O of n. That's a linear, linear time algorithm. The much simpler recursive version that we looked at, that's actually order r to the n. And in this case, r is roughly equal to 1.62. That's better than order 2 to the n, but it's still exponential. Not great. I'll leave it to your college algorithms professor or maybe uh, your, your AOA teacher to, to prove with you that the recursive algorithm is r r to the n in 
some rigorous mathematical way, but it's easy for us to take a look and just sort of see in a simple way that the, the number of recursive calls increases pretty quickly with n. As an example here, we can see the number of calls that it takes when we want to calculate the sixth Fibonacci number. It's actually, it's quite a lot, right? And we can do a, a similar count here and we can see how quickly it grows. The 32nd Fibonacci number takes 4.4 million recursive calls. That is a lot. And that's very, very fast growth compared to say the fourth Fibonacci number, which only took five recursive calls. If you have a moment, uh, play around with this program a little bit, uh, which uses a static variable to keep track of the number of recursive calls, and, and uh, uh, run this to, to play a little bit with it and observe the, the number of recursive calls as it varies with the size of the Fibonacci number uh, by yourself. Lots of algorithms don't have a single measure of their complexity that applies to every possible case. You know, sometimes an algorithm's behavior improves or it gets worse when it gets a particular data set or a particular arrangement of that data set. So for example, think about the bubble sorter algorithm that we talked about before. If your data set is already sorted, bubble sort only takes n minus one comparisons. And then we recognize that it's sorted and we exit immediately. That's pretty good, that's, that's linear runtime. But in lots of other cases, bubble sort is gonna take a solid n squared, a solid quadratic runtime. And a lot of people spend a lot of energy doing this kind of detailed mathematical analysis uh, to, so that they can figure out how an algorithm behaves in each of these three cases, in its best case, in its worst case, in its average case. You know, so when does an algorithm do the, the least amount of work, uh, the most amount of work, and, and under what circumstances is the algorithm doing its sort of typical amount of work? How complex is it on average? Let's take a look at three examples of this kind of analysis, just sort of, again, playing pretty fast and loose. Starting with summation, well, you know that the summation algorithm has to visit every single number in the array, no matter how many numbers there are, no matter how they're ordered, so the algorithm is always linear. So it's best case, worst case, and average case are all the same, all O of n. Linear search is a little bit different. We'll consider only the case, we'll, we'll assume that the target is in the array. This algorithm stops and returns the result as soon as we find the target element. So, in the best case, the element's right there at the first position waiting for us. In the worst case, the target is all the way at the end of the array. On an average, it's somewhere in the middle. So that means its best case is a constant time search. And both the worst case and the average case are roughly of order n. Again, this is a situation where n over 2 really just got simplified through our sort of hand wavy approach to O of n. So when we're doing complexity analysis, those kinds of factors don't really matter to us. If we look at the smarter version of bubble sort that can quit as soon as there are no swaps, as soon as the array is totally sorted, uh, well, in the best case, if the input array is already sorted, that means that the runtime is O of n. It's an n minus one. We saw that already. This case is really rare. But in the worst case, even this version of the bubble sort, even our smarter version, ends up having an n squared runtime. Its average case behavior is also O of n squared, uh, although it's pretty involved to prove that. A little bit more involved than it was for linear search. So if you'd like, you can investigate that a bit more on your own. What we'll commonly see is that there are some algorithms whose best case and average case scenarios are pretty similar, but whose worst case scenarios are way, way worse. The behavior really degrades for the worst case. And that's something that you'll have to keep in mind as you're choosing an algorithm to solve a particular problem. You'll treat this at great length and in great detail in your next CS class, most likely. Give these a shot before you close up shop. Uh, you find the, com the complexity of factorial and uh, take a look at this sorting method and see if you can uh, come to a complexity for it as well.